one can say in some sense that mathematics is the science of infinity. I want to quote, if I find it, uh, the famous quotation by, right? you know that without infinity, if you don't have the axiom of infinity, then you just do essentially finite combinatorics and then nothing interesting, really. And here is a sentence from Hermann Weyl in 1932. Purely mathematical inquiry in itself, by its special character, its certainty and stringency, lifts the human mind into closer proximity with the divine. The religious intuition of the infinite, the apparel in Greek, took hold of the Greek soul. So, uh, I will not deal with religious questions, but I will deal with philosophical uh, questions a little bit. So, you, you all know that Cantor said theory was created around 1870, and even already in the definition of a set in 1883, there were various definitions of a set, but in the definition of a set in 1883, Cantor says, by a set I understand in general every many big M that can be thought of as a one. And with this I believe to define something that is the kind to the Platonic Eidos or Idea. Cantor favored in me this term over Aristotle's only potential appeal. Okay, so you know the, the, the questions of uh, the definition of sets. I don't mean, you know a lot about infinity, so I am in, in contact with specialists. And let me remind you that the, you know that there were already many problems and philosophical discussion, which we consider it in our book. I will give you some example. And here is a sentence from Cantor. He writes, we observe a dialectical generation of concepts which leads always further and which in doing so remains free the term, important term is free, from any arbitrariness necessary and consistent in itself. So you know the construction, usually when people, when I, people explain to non-specialists set theory, they hide the difficult part, because you know that there is a non-trivial part, the, the connection, the, the dialectic between cardinals and ordinals is not trivial at all. It, it, it leads immediately to, to problems of uh, classification. Is there a complete classification of, uh, of all cardinals by the uh, ordinality assumption and all this? So, I have the sentence in German, it doesn't matter. But this word of, of free mathematics, which he felt was, he was, he was led to develop naturally the concepts and so it was free and in the same time there was something logical in it, so it was very much at the beginning. So you will see that again a little uh, later. And then there were problems in France because uh, they started to, to discuss the translation of Cantor's uh, text in French. And the French uh, mathematicians were afraid by the philosophical part of it. It was mixed because Cantor was very good in philosophy and he had a large knowledge of theology, of philosophy, he knew Spinoza and, and Descartes and uh, he had contacts, as you know, with the, with the theologians. Uh, so, the French translation was given to a priest who knew who had been translating Kant and who the mathematician thought it was better to give him and they started to, the first publication, they, they cut the philosophical part of it. And so we write this way, the discussion in France became necessary because of various antinomies. So you know that very quickly started the first among the first antinomy 
Antinomy meets paradox with a philosophical uh, point of view inside. Yeah? So, so uh, quickly, Cantor had the idea that uh, the continuum was a bigger infinity than the enumerable, and then he had the diagonal uh, criterion for, for this, to call this, and then he extended, he understood that for any set, then the set of parts, el conjunto de las partes de cualquier uh, conjunto es más grande que el conjunto. P of X has a bigger cardinal than X. There is no bijection between a set and a set of its parts. I'm not, uh, you know this better than me. So, he was confronted with this immediately because if you take the unions of all sets, then it, is, it contains all the sets, and in the same time you, you construct a bigger set by taking the, the set of, of parts of it. So, these uh, uh, first contradictions led a strong opposition in France. We are interested in seeing this discussion, and for example, Picard, let me remind you that Picard is famous for function of one complex variable, but also for other stuff in mathematics. He was quite a good mathematician, but he was also a member of the French Academy of Literature. So he writes for him about, about the, the, the contradiction and all this. These speculations about infinity are a completely new chapter in the history of mathematics of recent years. And he's right, because it's new, because there is no, the problem of the existence of these infinities is going to raise very, very quickly. But it is necessary to recognize that this chapter is not exempt of paradoxes. Thus, one can define certain numbers that belong, and at the same time, do not belong to specific sets. All problems of this type are caused by a lack of agreement of what existence means. He was a... Uh, he was good. He understood that uh, the problem. Some believers in set theory are scholastics, and this is the second word I want you to remember because we will go back to these two words later. Who would have loved to discuss the proof of the existence of God to Saint Anselm and his opponent, Gonilon, the monk of Noirmoutier? So this refers to a famous story of medieval ages that Saint Anselm gave a proof of the existence of God. And the proof is very simple. God has all uh, properties. He's perfect, so he has all properties. Among the, his properties there is existence. So God exists. Point. This, one, this is exactly. Now, why, why is there much to say about it? I think historically it's interesting, philosophically it's interesting, but recently, in the last couple of days, I heard three or four talks about Saint Anselm, ontological proof from a religious theologian point of view, and this is not interesting. I mean, there's nothing more to say. Because what happened is that Gödel, whom you know, very famous logician and mathematician and a great mind of the 20th century. At some point, he decided to give a logical proof of the existence of God following Saint Anselm and he invented some kind of logic. But at that time, it was already a little bit psychically insane. So I don't think there's much more to say. So, and Gonilo is the monk, uh, there is a discussion, Gonilo brings the uh, discussion. Uh, okay, and, and, uh, and my comment is, Anderson is well known for his ontological proof of the existence of God. Strange irony of history, Saint Anselm found a modern partisan with God. Okay. Now, there was another guy who was quite interested in, in, in discussion of set theory. It is Dubois Raymond, a German mathematician, even though he had a, a, a strange French name. 
he rejected the philosophy of the continuum. For him, it was a reduction of continuous quantities to discrete, whereas for, for Cantor, whereas in the eyes of Dubois, he wanted the continuum had a mystical nature outside of, of mathematical knowledge. And it is interesting because you find the intuitionic Brewer definition of the continuum, you find again this idea of some kind of mystical, uh, mysterious uh, notion of the continuum, and also freeness, free sequence of choices. The continuum from Brewer is defined, he refused the definition that was used by Cantor, and instead it was called the free choice sequences. The a real point is a free choice sequence meaning uh, something like, uh, well, it's complicated, but it's, uh, you choose at each step, but you don't choose. In the definition of Rua, uh, uh, a real noun is something that is chosen later on. It, it's not given as a point. It's free choice, zero, one, zero, one, you cut, and that's OK. Then, what happened is this. Then I want to tell you something very precise story. So the French mathematicians who were working on these questions were essentially Borel, Baer, and Lebesgue. And these three, for different reasons, so Borel was born in 1871, Baer in 1874, and Lebesgue in 1875. So even though Borel was a little older, they were all three of the same generation. And they suffered of this situation, and they finally they stopped working on, on this thing for, for, for various reasons. They found it too difficult and mixing with too much philo philosophical issue. Borel was a very down-to-earth uh, mathematician. For him, I quote someone, Borel has numbers and earth from where under his shoes, because he was very country type of. He had a farm with a lot of animals, and uh, he was very concrete. And later on, when he stopped doing this uh, set theory that frightened him, he, he wanted to be useful and he wanted to apply mathematics. The bag was not was not like like that. But uh, when he saw what happened, René Baer, René Baer was a philosophical and a lot of meditation type of person, but he was suffering from the difficulties of the problems he was, uh, uh, he had to solve, and uh, he was in bad uh, shape. He, he, he died quite early and suffered from all this. So the French school was in, in competition with the, the German school, and in particular, the problem was the axiom of choice. You know that there was a discussion about the, the, the axiom of, of choice, and at some point, the Armello thought he had solved everything, and Lebeg puts it later. The Armello arrived, and the fight began. Because what the discussion was, also Jacques Adamar was involved in this. The discussion was the existence of certain sets. It was obvious from elementary consideration that there were some sets that could, could be very clearly defined, but you could not give any example of an element of the set. So I will uh, give you an example. Um, So for example, you take a, a real number between 0 and 1, and you say that this number is normal if there is as much 0, as much 1, as much 9, and also as much 0, 1, then 0, 2, then 9, 9. So this is a normal number. Each time you take a, a, a a piece of k uh, digits forming it themselves, then the k digits occur as you imagine 
all dig digits occur. So you count the number of digits possible, and each digit occurs at one over the number. So this is a normal, normal number. Okay. So one can find examples. But now suppose that you want a normal number between zero and one with this property in all bases. Then it gets harder. But obviously, from elementary measure theory due to Boeck, for example, the set of elements which are normal exists and is of measure one. It's, there are many numbers. But how do you, do you give one example? It's impossible. Okay, so Lebeg, who was also in competition with, with Borel on this question of measure, so he knew that the argument of, of Borel were, were okay, writes, so it's around 1905 that they have an exchange of letters, Adamar, Borel, Lebeg, and Baer. So he writes the following, is it possible to prove the existence of a mathematical object without defining it. So one knows, for example, what I said now, that there is a number which has these properties, but define it. So then you have this, in comparison, that yes, you have this axiom of choice of the Armelo, which says that if you take any empty set, you can uh, take one element in it without problem. Okay, so this discussion were going on and Lebeg writes in a later, uh, in a note in 1904 talking about the different integration and, and, and function classes I succeeded in, in giving function and defining function, naming functions and sets of any class so refers to some class I don't want to go into. I could also name a function that being in any class escapes any definition and this function allows one to know non-measurable Borel sets. The classification of sets and functions should give a solid basis for theory of transfinite types of which is the theory of infinities by by contour. So this is the first time one sees the question of naming in the French mathematical uh, literature. And essentially, they stop there. So we have still a, a sentence by the bank. The various definition that I succeeded in naming function, I could name a function which belongs to no class, class so escapes from any analytical definition. So I don't want to go too much in the mathematical uh, description. And then we go to a different part of the mathematical world. So in Moscow, there had been some, we go to Russia. Unfortunately, our Russian friend is not there. In Russia, the school of mathematics was at the very low level, there were very little things, and there had been some classes given of uh, uh, set theory, just one, one publication, and it was interesting for philosophical, they were mixing as usual philosophy and mathematics, and they didn't know. And then, Rosin, young Russian, not yet mathematician, was sent to Paris, so I don't give too many details there in our book. He was sent to Paris and he was in the same time interested in philosophy. He was reading Greek philosophers, Plotinus, Neoplatonist philosophers, and going to the seminar of these people, Borel, Adama, and started. And when he came back, he started to have students. And he gave to a young, very gifted student a paper of Lebeck to read 
they were just isolated in Moscow and losing had brought some. Uh, so you can see the photos in our book, and, uh, description of the life in Paris and in Moscow. So he gave him a paper of Lebec in 1905 to a young student called Suski, student of music. And after some short time, I don't remember how long, Suskin came back and said to Luzin there is a mistake. And essentially, the mistake which has given the beginning, really, of descriptive set theory begins in 1917 when Suslin, who unfortunately died very quickly later because of the condition of life and tifus. So Suslin comes in the office and we know very precisely the story because Sierpinski, Polish mathematician, was there and he, he, he told the story. Uh, Suslin arrived and said there's a mistake. And the mistake amounts to the fact that P of A intersected with B is not P of A intersected with P of B. Any elementary uh, PhD student has to know that. It's not true because P of A intersected P of B can be empty and uh, okay. I don't uh, go into the details. And this is the beginning because applied to certain infinite family of set, this mistake, if I can apply a mistake, this mistake shows that images of projective sets are not projective sets. Then it's a new class, I, the details uh, one can find, uh, uh, the details I can give you the reference. And so the, the classification of what will become the classification, the description of, of sets, started, started there. And they were more enthusiastic and more, uh, they, they went further than the French school who got frightened. And this is, we have proved by archives and documents that one of the key things, which I don't want to go too much in, 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 is that some of these guys like Luzin, Yegorov, who was his teacher and friend, were influenced by a heretic religious sect in the Orthodox Church in Moscow called the Name Worshippers, for which there was a religious value to naming. And our claim, which is not 100% proved, is that these motivated them, influenced them positively in not being afraid uh, to compute the sets which are named without being described entirely. Because the next step, the natural step that they had to solve, that they were hoping to solve, was the continuum hypothesis. And continuum hypothesis is essentially proving Describing, describing any subset of zero one of the continuum, right? Because you want to prove that the, there is no set between the enumerable and the continuum. So you have to describe to be able to handle any part of the continuum. And to 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 do that, you need to handle. So you need. So they were. They were not afraid by the naming procedure. And losing work very hard, and we have archived that we quote, that he was influenced and motivated by some kind of positive, uh, religiously original uh, feeling that he could use naming as a process to work with these mathematical objects. OK, so this is essentially the, the part of what I wanted to say that refers to, to our book, The Learning Gram, Naming Infinity, and of course, uh, this is the story is not over. But before I go to the modern times, I want to 
say something about somebody very important for this story, and maybe because of some of you, like Samuel, are connected with topology, and this is Hausdorff. And Hausdorff is also a very important figure in the creation of modern mathematics. And it is not surprising that Hausdorff had two, he as a genius B. Franz personality. He's a fantastic uh, man because he is the, one of the main creators of modern topology, as everybody knows. And in the same time, he was a writer and a philosopher under a different name, Mongré. M-O-N-G-L-A, which in French, in old French, means to my taste, mon gré, to my pleasure. And there has been, I'm not sure if it's completely published, but there has been a very hard work of edition, of complete work of, of um, Hausdorff. And I don't want to go, of course, the house of spaces, you, you know, and probably you know that he, had, he was also um, writing about chaotic. He he was influenced. It's a. Com Is there any, any question about house of? Is there any, some question? No, no. Uh, house of is uh, German. German, German, German. Yes, yes, yes. He was German, German as, a, as a mathematician, he was French as a, as a philosopher. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, he gave to the French name, but he was German, he wrote everything in German. No, no he wrote everything in German. Oh, yes, everything in German. But under a different name. And one of his, uh, you know, he's really a fantastic person. One of his books published one of his first philosophical texts when he was 30 was Das Chaos in Kosmische Hauslese. Chaos in cosmic selection, selection. and uh, and also another book was Der Schleier der Mayas. Another book is Santilario. So uh, fancy. He was he went to topology through a very strange way from Nietzsche, eternal return. Who you know? I don't know in German, but the eternal return, the retour éternel. He tried, yes. he thought about the uh, space and general philosophy ideas coming from this idea of eternal return, and he went into the mathematical aspects of it, and that led him to topology. This is a fantastic. Uh, okay, so I don't want, I am not able to give a general lecture on Hausdorff, but, but I will give you some ideas to show how deep this man was, because you will see that we find again the word free. So this is a Hausdorff lecture, I don't know the, the, the time exactly, in the 20s. A Hausdorff lecture devoted to Raum problem, the problem of space. And he identified, this was, he was thinking about topology, about geometry, but about space in a very general way. And he identifies three spaces, which he calls three Spielraum, play spaces. In French, I don't know how I need to translate that in French. Espace de jeu, it sounds like a kinder child, yeah, yeah. so it's no good. An espace de jeu, okay. So, Spiel, the, the space. The, the play space of thought, the play space of intuition, and the play space of experience. Spielraum des Denkens, Spielraum der Handschauen, Spielraum der Erfahrung. So the last one, experience, is connected with the physical uh, experimental sciences. And the two other ones, one is Handschauen uh, and one is Denkens. I don't know exactly uh, uh, where this where he got his, in, in, his inspiration, but the, the, the Spielraum of thought was very large indeed, this is quotation from Hausdorff. It was the source of the creative freedom that Hausdorff said, writes, 
mathematics has acquired not without struggle against philosophical att attempts at su suppression. And unfortunately, as you may know, the Spielraum of Hausdorff finished in a very sad way in 1942. He was about to be interned in a, 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 a convent, Andenish cloister. And uh, then he was menaced to be deported to the Regenstein and he killed himself with his uh, wife and his daughter-in-law. His sister-in-law, sorry. Okay, so this was, I, I, I promised to show you the word freedom again. This is what I have done. And now I will say a few words about uh, modern situation. So the modern situation, I think it is interesting to see from my point of view uh, set theory and mathematical logic uh, are developing in two main uh, directions. One is uh, search in the search of infinity and is, it is going on with uh, big set theory and large cardinal and this program for which you are, uh, I think, better, uh, better uh, position than, than me to talk about. But I think that it is interesting to notice that the idea, if one looks at the program of Woodin, the Omega logic, and the maximal ontological program of Principle. So the principle of Woodin is a principle that he does not uh, claim as mathematical because it has, a, to me, one cannot doubt that it has philosophical uh, background because he says any axiom. So the maximal, if I am not right, you will correct me. The maximal uh, principle of Woodin say that any axiom that tends to enlarge the category of sets is good. It is an a priori positive and we, we should develop in this direction. And this moral principle to me it has no mathematical background. It is a meta-mathematical, it is heuristical, uh, right? So in, in general, I think that most of mathematical uh, uh, theories are developed with a motivation which is outside the theory. But here, the, motiv the motivation is a, is a philosophical motivation. You want to enlarge because you, you, you you know that this uh, category, this big family V, is you want to enlarge it. So this is in one direction, and uh, and I think there is a completely different uh, direction, which is uh, the constructive approach. So let me tell you a few words, even though it's a very different topic. So the story is this: brilliant young. Russian mathematician, Voyevodsky, did uh, fantastic work in homotopy algebraic topology and solved some, at least two very important conjectures that deserve uh, to him the Fields Medal in 19, uh, I don't know, 2002 maybe. And then things happened to him. Uh, one thing, he started to, to have some 
problems connected with mathematics. And second, there were some mistakes in later work that were not uh, discovered for a while, for a few years, in, in later work. And he decided he would try to confront with this problem and also with the problem that the referee articles now, as you know, I think we were talking about it at lunchtime. If you have a 600 pages, very complicated article, you give it for a referee for the Annals of Mathematics, and it takes two or three years, so people put it on archive. And also, you know that for the first time, uh, uh, the Annals of Mathematics has published an article, I think it is past Dr. Hayes with Kepler conjecture where there is a, a, a two lines at the beginning saying that the, 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 the committee of annals of mathematics cannot ensure that the whole thing is true because some computer AD, etc. It was the first time the annals of mathematics was published. So Wojewski started to, to think about this and he decided also for a kind of moral reason that he wanted to do something that would be more useful. So he started to work and uh, to work for uh, you know, software that would check proof, proof checker, not, not automatic prover, but proof checker. And the result is that he has built up whole new theory, which you can find, for example, in discussion in two seminars of Bourbaki of June 2004, and you can find them also, uh, there's a Wikipedia on two topics, one is univalent, univalent theory, and the other is HOTT, homotopy theory of types, and these are works in progress and they are discussion. But the main thing is that they have constructed some way of being able to, to do proof checking, to prove, and, and uh, to prove in a very solid way the proofs of the theorems and the, the correctness of the proofs of theorems. And the idea is complicated, but it relies first, instead of sets, replaced by types, essentially Russell idea of types from the years beginning of the century. And the second idea is that because types can be connected with, uh, in some way with homotopy, then the proof of the solidity of the system relies on some very strong theorems that the Wojewski proved for in the time of his field method. So it's a very, there's been a huge work, a seminar of one year at Princeton, which exists in the, in the, in the shape of a, of a book, which is downloadable. There are these two s s lectures at the uh, Bobaki seminar. There was a six-month seminar in Paris, and things are in progress, and uh, I think it's a very solid uh, Direction, and I don't want to say that 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 the, the infinity search is uh, is not uh, doable, uh, but some there's a strong opposition. And for example, uh, my friend David Mumford, who is very opposed to the large cardinal and all this, says that above projective sets, he doesn't believe in the, in the existence. It depends what you call existence. But still, the discussion is still very. He says that this thing, things are scholastic, so he takes back the same discussion that existed in the Middle Age and in the Picard's discussion. So I think this is this is what makes mathematics quite rich: is that uh, discussions go on and uh, the, the, the science progresses. The discussion go on. Okay, I think I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.